Hi, this is Tzvi Rosen, and in today's lecture, we're going to talk about the commutator subgroup. We'll start with some definitions. Uh, let's take x and y to be elements of G, a group. Then we say that the commutator of x and y uh, is denoted in brackets. Bracket x, y bracket is defined as x inverse y inverse x, y. Okay. If we have a pair of subsets A and B in G, then the, gr then the group denoted by bracket AB is, is the subgroup generated by the commutators of A and B, where A comes from A and B comes from B. When A and B are both G, we obtain what's called the commutator subgroup of G, and that's often denoted as G prime. Uh, which we define as bracket GG. Let's start with D8 as an example. Okay, D8 is the group of symmetries of the square. It's generated by R, a rotation by 90 degrees, and S, reflection across one of the lines of symmetry. The relations are R to the fourth equals S squared equals 1, and RS equals SR inverse, or SR cubed. So let's compute a commutator. So if we have bracket RS, that's going to be equal to R inverse S inverse RS, which is the same as R cubed SRS. Using the uh, relations on the group, we have RS equals SR cubed. So we're going to sub that in to obtain R cubed S, S R cubed. Grouping these together, we have S squared, which is the identity. So we get R cubed times R cubed, or R to the sixth. Uh, since R to the fourth is one, that leaves us with R squared. Okay, so we learn that R squared is a commutator in the group D8. And in fact, uh, the identity and R squared are the only commutators. And you can check that going through pairs of elements. Let's look at another group. Consider the group S3, the permutation group on three letters. I must compute a commutator of the two permut the transpositions 1, 2, and 1, 3. So we have 1, 2 inverse 1, 3 inverse 1, 2, 1, 3. Uh, obviously, transpositions are their own inverses, so we can replace this with 1, 2, 1, 3, 1, 2, 1, 3. And looking at how this function would act on each element, this sends 1, first goes to 3, and then goes back to 1, followed by 2. So 1 goes to 2. 2 first goes to 1, then goes to 3, and stays there. And 3 goes to 1, then 2, then 1. Okay, and so what we find is this is the cycle 1, 2, 3. Okay, so the 3 cycle, 1, 2, 3, is a commutator. And in fact, the commutator subgroup is the one that's generated by this three cycle. It's the, it's the identity and the two three cycles in S3. Cool. So, uh, so we have a sense of what a commutator subgroup looks like in particular examples, but why is it useful? Well, this first property captures uh, some of the importance of a commutator. We can see that xy equals yx times the commutator x bracket xy. This tells us that when bracket xy is the identity, x and y commute. So in some way, the commutator is capturing how much these things are non-commuting. Okay, and let's just verify this from the formula. So if we have yx times bracket xy, that's equal to yx x inverse y inverse xy from the formula. Okay, and then this pair uh, 
combines and cancels, and we're left with y, y inverse x, y. This pair also combines and cancels, and we're left with x, y. Okay, and that confirms the assertion in the bullet point. x, y equals y, x, bracket x, y. Um, now let's look at the next assertion. If h is a normal subgroup of g, or rather that condition is equivalent to the condition that the commutator of h and g is a subgroup of h. So let's take a look at what that means. So if h is normal in g, okay, so we want to show that, so let's, let's go this way first. We want to show that the commutator is contained in h. So what is the commutator? This is the subgroup of g, which is generated by commutators of elements in h with elements in g. Okay, but what is that equal to from the definition? That's just h inverse g inverse h g. Again, h and h, g and g. Okay, but we know that g inverse h g is in h because h is normal. And we also know that h inverse is in h. Okay, that's by subgroup properties. So the two of those together imply that this commutator, h inverse g inverse hg, is in h. Okay. So this is in h, which means that, or the generators, let me put that, put it this way. Generators are in h. Therefore, the group that they generate is also contained in H. Okay, going the other way. We're looking to show the other direction. So we're assuming that, suppose, HG is contained in H, and we want to show that H is normal. Well, if HG is contained in H, that means that every commutator is in H. Okay, so for any H in H, G in G, we know that H inverse g inverse hg is in h, but that means that um, g inverse hg is, if we multiply both sides by h, we have g inverse hg is in hh, -H, but that's just h because of closure of subgroups. So this tells us that H is normal. Okay, very good. So we've learned two properties so far about the commutators. And now we can prove that G prime is a normal subgroup of G. Again, G prime is the commutator of G with itself. It's the group of all group generated by commutators in uh, G. Okay, so Let's show that this is true, and, and uh, the first claim will be as follows. If you have an automorphism of your group, then, then sigma of g prime will still be g prime. Okay, and the reason this works is if you take any commutator in g, so let's take um, bracket x, y, and apply sigma. Well, this is sigma of x inverse y inverse x, y. 
Um, but because of properties of homomorphisms, this is sigma x inverse sigma y inverse sigma x sigma y. And that's uh, plainly equal to the commutator of sigma x sigma y. So starting with a commutator and applying an automorphism of the group, we get another commutator, okay? And um, because sigma is bijective, any commutator can be obtained this way. Okay, so this is, I'll just prove, this is proved that sigma of g prime is equal to g prime. Well, there's a kind of a standard automorphism, which is the inner automorphisms. So, so any inner automorphism phi g, which takes um, g to itself mapping h to g h g inverse, then we know that phi g of g prime is still going to be equal to g prime. And that tells us that um, conjugation preserves this subgroup, which means it's normal. OK. As for the next claim, that g mod g prime is abelian, so let's consider uh, what the operation on these cosets looks like. So if we have x g prime times y g prime, okay, by definition of quotient groups, this is going to be equal to x y times g prime. But from our first property of commutators, we saw that x y is equal to y x times uh, bracket x y times g prime. Uh, bracket x, y is a commutator, so you can absorb that into g prime so that this is, in fact, equal to y, x, g prime. Okay, and this is what you would get if, from the start, you multiplied the cosets in this order. Okay, so that implies that, that uh, the quotient group is abelian. Um, but it's not just any abelian quotient. G mod G prime is going to be the largest abelian quotient of your group G. Okay, so let's prove that. Uh, and we'll prove it in this form. Given any subgroup H, the condition that H is normal and its quotient is abelian is equivalent to saying that G prime is a subgroup of H. Okay, so... Whatever subgroup you're taking and getting an abelian quotient, you can take a smaller subgroup, i.e. g prime, which is contained in there, and get a larger quotient. Okay, so let's go this way first. So suppose you have h normal in g and g mod h abelian. Okay. Let's use the fact that g mod h is abelian. So we know that xh y h is equal to y h x h okay that's equivalent just by definition of how the quotient op the operation works on quotients to x y h being equal to y x h and that's equivalent to saying that Okay, first multiplying on the left by y inverse, then x inverse, we get x inverse y inverse x y h equals h. That tells us that um, x inverse y inverse is, uh, x y must be an h. Okay, and we this had to be the, the case for any x and y in G because this group is, this quotient group is abelian. So this tells us that every commutator uh, 
uh, x bracket xy has to be an h, which means that g prime is going to be a subgroup of h. Okay. How about the other way? So suppose g prime is a subgroup of h. Okay. Sorry, is it, uh, yeah, so it's g prime is a subgroup of h. So that means that by the fourth isomorphism theorem, we know that the subgroups of g containing g prime are in bijection with the subgroups of g mod a of g mod g prime. So we have exists h tilde in, uh, or rather, as a subgroup of g mod g prime. Okay. Okay. So because g mod g prime is an abelian group, that means that conjugation doesn't affect anything. So that implies that h tilde is normal in g. Sorry, in g mod g prime. But we know that uh, by the fourth isomorphism theorem again, h tilde is normal in g mod g prime if and only if h is normal in g. Okay. Furthermore, let's consider the quotient g mod h. By the third isomorphism theorem, this is going to be equal to g mod g prime mod h mod g prime. Okay. Since we have a quotient of an abelian group by a subgroup, we know that this is going to be abelian. Okay, so that implies that G mod H is, will also be abelian. Okay, so this shows the other direction. So in a fundamental way, this G prime gives us the canonical abelian quotient of our group G. So for that reason, G mod G prime is often called the abelianization of G, or G ab, the ab in a superscript. Okay, now we'll do one neat gadget involving the commutator subgroup, and this is called the derived series of G. If you let G upper zero be defined as your starting group G, and then you inductively define G upper n as the com as the commutator subgroup of g upper n minus 1, then the derived series is g upper n um, patent goes to g upper 1, sorry, g upper 0 is your first group, and then g upper 1 is a normal subgroup of that, g upper 2 is a normal subgroup of that, etc. Okay, some special cases. If g upper 1 is E, okay, just the identity, the trivial subgroup, then your group G is abelian. The reason for that being that your commutator subgroup is trivial, which means that every pair of elements commutes. If g upper n is E, the trivial subgroup, for any, uh, for any positive integer n, that means your group is solvable. Okay, there's, there's a solving sequence. This has to do with Galois groups and finding uh, solutions to polynomials using radicals. Let's do a few examples to see what this looks like. So we already saw what the commutator of D8 was. This was, was R squared. Um, and R squared as a subgroup of D8, uh, this is just isomorphic to Z2, which is an abelian group. So that has commutator E. So the derived series for D8 is... D8 contains R squared, contains uh, the identity. And you can keep 
this going out since the identity is its own commutator, if you like. Okay, how about S4? Well, it's a little tricky since uh, doing all of the commutators would take a little while. But let's see what our options are. We know that S4, that the, the commutator subgroup would have to be normal. be normal in S4. Uh, and there aren't that many normal subgroups of S4. We have A4 is normal. We know there is a Klein 4 subgroup here, which is generated by uh, the pairs of transpositions. Okay, this is enough to generate, even though it also contains another one. And then there's obviously S4 itself and E4, uh, sorry, E, the trivial subgroup. Okay, so if the commutator subgroup were the trivial subgroup, then the group would be abelian. But we know S4 is not abelian. Okay. Um, as for the full S4, well, something about the, the uh, commutators is that every commutator, because you take, however, whether it's an even or an odd permutation, you're taking its inverse as well as itself. So the number of permutation, number of transpositions here is going to be even. This is going to be an even transposition, an even permutation. Jeez. And that means that it's going to be contained in A4. Okay, so that means that it can't be S4 because uh, it has to be A4 or smaller. So now we're, we're between A4 and V. V is a subgroup of A4, so conceivably it could be there. But if you check for yourself, you'll see that uh, 1, 2, 3, 1, 4, if you try to compute this commutator, so this is 1, 3, 2, 1, 4, 1, 2, 3, 1, 4. You can check this is 1, 3, 4. Okay? This is not in V. So that tells us that V cannot be our commutator group subgroup. So our commutator subgroup is A4. Okay, so we're still working on S4. And so far we found that S4 has as its commutator subgroup A4. And now we need to find the commutator subgroup of A4. Okay, A4 has the following normal subgroups. It's got the identity. It has that Klein 4 subgroup we saw before. And it also has um, the full subgroup A4. Okay, so again, the trivial subgroup can't be uh, the commutator subgroup because this is not an abelian group. Um, as for V, let's check that, let's check if A4 mod V is abelian. So A4 mod V, just from the cardinality perspective, this is 12 divided by 4, which is 3. So that has to be a cyclic group, which means it's abelian. Okay, so that tells me that V, uh, or something smaller than it, must be the commutator subgroup, but there's no normal subgroup contained in V, so that tells me that V is my answer. Okay. 
uh, now that we have V, V is, is actually an abelian group. So its commutator subgroup is the trivial subgroup. And since we've eventually arrived at the trivial subgroup, this tells us that S4 is solvable. Okay. And this is part of why um, there is a formula using radicals to solve a quartic equation. Okay, so quartic equations are solvable in radicals. Okay. Now let's look at one final example, S5. So we saw in a previous lecture that S5 has um, only three normal subgroups, and that is E, A5, and S5. Okay, E is not eligible because S5 is not abelian. A5 is our, our next largest uh, normal subgroup. And in fact, S5 mod A5 is isomorphic to Z2. So this is the commutator subgroup. It's, it's the smallest normal subgroup whose quotient is abelian. So we can write for our derived series S5 and then commutator subgroup A5. What's the next term? Well, A5, we learned, is a simple group. Okay, and that would mean that its commutator subgroup is either, it has to be a normal subgroup, so it's either the trivial subgroup or all of A5. And we know that A5 is not abelian, so E is ruled out. And that tells us that A5 must be the commutator subgroup, which means that this series will never terminate at the trivial subgroup. And that tells us that S5 is not solvable, which is why Degree 5 equations are not, in general, solvable by radical. Okay, uh, and that's it for the commutator subgroup. Thanks.